Um, firstly, I'd like to say hello, everyone, and I hope you guys are all keeping safe. Uh, welcome to the Architecture Foundation's Bedtime Stories. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope everyone's keeping safe because it's been quite, quite a stressful time at the moment. So I'm hoping that with the, you guys will enjoy this piece. So my name is Sean Adams. I'm, I'm in the current cohort of the, <clears throat> sorry, the New Architecture Writers. And I'm also studying MA Architecture at the Royal College of Art. So after this, I've got to do a bit of um, uni work. So it's not quite a, a bed, that bedtime story for me. Um, before, before I start, so we've still got five minutes. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Alicia and Ro Rosie for putting this together. I think this is a, um, a really good, um, like these bedtime stories have been really, really good. And I've learned a lot from a lot of the pieces people have um, read. Um, I think the piece, the piece that I, I, I've actually chosen, I think it speaks a lot of about the things that are currently happening. So, in, especially in the events in America, um, I think I don't want to speak too much about the piece because I think it's a very powerful piece and it speaks for itself. But um, this piece is, yeah, it speaks a lot about racism and how you actually, how racism can really affect the way you you go about and navigate the city. So today I'm going to be reading Walking While Black by Garnet Cad Cadogan. This is an essay which first appeared in For Fire, Fist Time, A New Generation Speaks About about Race. I'd like to say a shout out to my new architecture writer tutors because they're, the, they're the ones that actually told me about this. I had never actually known about this essay. And yeah, it just it just stuck with me. It was such a powerful piece of text that that really made me think and really made me think about how I caught like what I think about when I'm walking because I think as designers, architects, urban planners, when we when we do the simple act of just walking down the street, um, there's so many things at play, so many things happening, so many different things that really make us experience the city differently. And I think in in Garnet's explanation of the city of how he feels is is, is really interesting especially for those of us are, that are living in London which is such a diverse city because you we might have come from another place and now are living in London and navigating London is completely different it's a massive city with so many people from different ethnicities in the city so everyone's experience is unique but I think in this essay it's really good because it makes you really consider what how other people experience the the city um but yeah we've got three more three more minutes before before i start so hopefully a few more people will be 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 flooding through i'm gonna quickly just check the the, the messages oh so fire emojis i think some some hearts <laughs> um but yeah so i'm gonna give it another three more minutes before we commence um the the essay itself if anyone's on the if anyone wants to check it, it it's just like an online is an online piece so you can actually just read it online you don't need to buy the whole the whole um, book that it actually featured in so that's that's pretty good um so yeah we've got we've got a little more time before before we start so just get it to go all right. So yeah, I think we've got we've got a few people. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna begin. I think the piece itself is should be about half an hour, just over half an hour. So so bear with me if if you if you nod off, it's fine. Like it, it's part of the bedtime story. All right. My love for walking started in childhood, out of necessity. No thanks to a stepfather with heavy hands. I found every reason to stay away from home and was usually out at some friend's house or at a street party where no minor should be until it was too late to get public transportation. So I walked. The streets of Kingston, Jamaica in the 1980s were often terrifying. You could, for instance, get killed if a political henchman thought you came from the wrong neighbourhood or even if you wore the wrong colour. Where an orange showed affiliation with one political party and green with the other. And if you were neutral or travelling far from home, you chose your colours well. The wrong colour in the wrong neighbourhood could mean your last day. No wonder then that my friends and the rare nocturnal passerby declared me crazy for my long late night treks that traversed war and political zones. And sometimes I did pretend to be crazy, shouting out sequiturs 
when I passed through especially dangerous spots, such as the place where free thieves hid on the banks of a storm drain. Predators would ignore or laugh at the kid in his school uniform speaking nonsense. I made friends with strangers and went from being a very shy and awkward kid to being an extroverted awkward one. For beggar, for vendor, for poor labourer, those were experienced wanderers and they became my nightmare instructors. If they knew the streets and delivered lessons on how to navigate and enjoy them, I imagined myself as a Jamaican Tom Sawyer, one moment swartering down the streets to pick low-hanging mangoes that I could reach from the sidewalk, another moment hanging outside a street party with battling sound systems, each armed with speakers powered to create skyscrapers of heavy bass. These streets weren't frightening. They were full of adventure when they weren't serene. There I joined force with a, ba a band of merry walkers who'd missed the last bus by mere minutes. Or feet still move, my feet still moving as we put our thumbs to hitchhike to spots near our home, making jokes as vehicle after vehicle raced past us. Or I'd get lost in Mitiesque moments, my young mind imagining alternate futures. The street had their own safety. Unlike at home, there I could be myself without fear of bodily harm. Walking became so regular and familiar that the way home became home. The streets had their rules and I loved the challenge of trying to master them. I learned how to be alert by surrounding dangers and nearby delights and prided myself on recognising telling details that my peers missed. Kingston was a map of complex and often bizarre cultural and political and social activity, and I appointed myself its nightmare, nighttime cartographer. I'd know how to navigate away from a predatory pace and to speed up to chat when the cadence of a gaint announced friendliness. It was, almost, it was almost always men I saw. A lone woman walking in the middle of the night was as common as a sight as a Sasquatch. Moonlight pedestrianism was too dangerous for her. Sometimes at night, as I made my way down from hills above Kingston, I'd, ha I'd have the impression that the city was set on pause or in extreme slow motion. As that as I descended, I was cutting across Jamaica's deep social divisions. I'd make my way briskly past the mansions in the hills overlooking the city, now transformed into a carpet of dotted lights under a curtain of stars. Swore to my, by middle-class subdivisions hidden behind high walls, crowned with barbed wire, and zigzag through neighbourhoods of zinc and wooden shacks crammed together and leaning like a tight-knit group of limbo dancers. With my descent came an increase on the vibrancy of street life. Except when it didn't, some poor neighbourhoods had both the violent gunfights and the eerily deserted streets of the cinematic Wild West. I knew well enough to avoid those, even at high noon. I'd begun hoofing it dark when I was 10 years old. By 13, I was rarely home before midnight. And some nights found me racing against dawn. My mother would often complain, saying, Why do you love the streets so much? You were born in a hospital, not in the streets. I left Jamaica in 1996 to attend college in New Orleans, a city I'd heard called the northernmost Caribbean city. I wanted to, discover, wanted to discover on foot, of course, what was Caribbean and what was American about it. Stately mansions on Oak Line streets with streetcars clanging by and brightly colored houses that made entire blocks look festive. People in resplendent costumes dancing to funky brass bands in the middle of the street. Cuisine and aromas that mashed up culinary traditions from Africa, Europe, Asia, and the American South. And the juxtaposition of, of worlds old and new, odd and familiar. Who wouldn't want to explore this? On my first day in the city, I went walking for a few hours to get a feel for the place and to buy supplies to tr transform my dormitory room from a prison bunker into a welcoming space. When some university staff found found out what I'd been up to, they warned me to restrict my walk into the places recommended as safe to tourists and the parents of freshmen. They trotted out statistics about New Orleans crime rate, but Kingston's crime rate dwarfed those numbers and I decided to ignore these well-mentioned cautions. A city was waiting to be discovered and I wouldn't let 
inconvenient facts get in my way. These American criminals had nothing on Kingston's, I thought. They're no real threat to me. What no one had told me was that I was the one who would be considered a threat. Within days, I noticed that many people on the street seemed apprehensive of me. Some gave me a circumspect glance as they approached, and then others crossed the street. Others ahead would glance behind, register my presence and then speed up. Older white women clutched their bags. Young white men nervously greeted me as if exchanging a salutation for their safety. What's up, bro? On one occasion, less than a month after my arrival, I tried to help a man whose wheelchair was stuck in the middle of a crosswalk. He threatened to shoot me in the face. Then, then he simply asked a white pedestrian for help. I wasn't prepared for any of this. I had come from a majority black country in which no one was wary of me because of my skin color. Now I wasn't sure who was afraid of me. I was especially unprepared for the cops. They regularly stopped and bullied me, asking questions that took my guilt for granted. I never received what many of my African-American friends call for talk. No parents had told me how to behave when I was stopped by the police, how to be as polite and cooperative as possible, no matter what they said or did to me. So I had to cobble together my own rules of engagement, thicken my Jamaican accent, quickly mention my college accidentally pull out my college identification card when asked for my driver's license. My survival tactics began well before I left my dorm. I got out of the shower with the police on my head, assembling a cop-proof wardrobe. Light-coloured Oxford shirt, v-neck sweater, khaki pants, chuckers, sweatshirt, or t-shirt with my university insignia. When I walked, I regularly had my identity challenged but I also found ways to assert it. So, I'd dress Ivy League style, but would later on add my Jamaican pedigree by wearing Clark's Desert Boots, the footwear of choice of Jamaican street culture. Yet, the all-American satirical choice of a white t-shirt with jeans, which many police officers see as the uniform of black troublemakers, was off limits to me. If I wanted to have the freedom of movement I desired. In this city of exuberant streets, walking became a complex and often oppressive negotiation. I would see a white woman walking towards me at night and cross the street to reassure her that she was safe. I would forget something at home but not immediately turn around if someone was behind me because I discovered that a sudden backtrack could cause alarm. I had a cardinal rule keep a wide perimeter from people who might consider me a danger. If not, danger might visit me. New Orleans suddenly felt more dangerous than Jamaica. The sidewalk was a minefield and every hesitation a self-censored composition reduced my dignity. Despite my best efforts, the streets never felt comfortably safe. Even a simple salutation was suspect. One night, returning to my house, eight years after my arrival, I thought I'd earned a right to call home. I waved a cop driving by. Moments later, I was against his car in handcuffs. When I later asked him, sheepishly of course, any other way would have asked for bruises, why he had detained me, he said my greeting had aroused his suspicion. No one waves to the police, he explained. Then I told my, when I told my friends his response, they said it was my behaviour, not his. And they saw it as being absurd. Now, why would you be so dumb to do a thing like that? One said. You know better not to make nice with the police. A few days after I left on a visit to Kingston, Hurricane Katrina slashed and pummeled New Orleans. I'd gone not because of the storm, but because my adoptive grandmother Pearl was dying of cancer. I hadn't wandered those streets in eight years since my last visit, and I returned to them now mostly at night, the time I found best for thinking, praying, and crying. I walked to feel less alienated from myself struggling with the pain of seeing my grandmother terminally ill. 
from my home in New Orleans, underwater and seemingly abandoned from my home country, which now precisely because of its childhood f- familiarity felt foreign to me. I was surprised by how familiar those streets felt. Here was the corner where the fragrance of jerk chicken greeted me, along with the warm tenor and peace and love message of Half Pint's greetings broadcast from a small but powerful speaker to at least a half a mile radius. It was as if I was walking into 1986, down to the soundtrack, and there was the wall of the neighbourhood shop, adorned with the Rastafarian colours, red, gold, green, along with images of the local and international heroes, Bob Marley, Marcus Garvey and Haile Selassie. The crew of boys leaning against it and joshing each other were recognisable, different faces, but similar stories. I was astonished at how safe the streets felt to me. Once again, one black body among many no longer having to anticipate the many ways my presence might instill fear and how to offer some reassuring body language. Passing police cars were once again merely passing police cars. Jamaican police could be pretty brutal, but they didn't notice me in the same way American police did. I could be invisible in Jamaica in the way I can't be invisible in the United States. Walking had returned to me a greater set of possibilities. And why walk? If not to create a new set of possibilities. Following separativity, I added new routes to the mental maps I had made from constant walking in the city from childhood to young adulthood. Traced variations on the old pathways. Serendipity. A mentor once told me is a secular way of speaking of grace. It's unearned unearned favour. Seen theologically, then walking is an act of faith. Walking is, after all, interrupted fallen. We see, we listen, we speak. And we trust that each step we take won't be our last. But will lead us into a richer understanding of ourself and the world. In Jamaica, I felt once again as if the only identity that mattered was my own, not the constricted one that others had constructed of me. I strolled into my better self. I said, along with Kierdegaard, I have walked myself into my best thoughts. When I tried to return to New Orleans from Jamaica a month later, there were no flights. I thought about flying to Texas so I could make my way back to the neighbourhood as soon as it opened for reoccupancy, But my adoptive aunt, Maxine, who hated the idea of me returning to our hurricane zone before the end of the hurricane season, persuaded me to come to stay in New York City instead. This wasn't a hard sell. I wanted to be in a place where I could travel by foot and more crucially, continue to reap the solace of walking at night. And I was eager to follow in the steps of the essayists, poets and novelists who'd wandered the great city before me. Walt Whiteman, Herman Melville, Alfred Kazin, Elizabeth Hardwick. I had visited the city before, but each trip had felt like a tour in a sports car. I welcomed the chance to stroll. I wanted to walk alongside Whiteman's ghost and descend to the pavements, merge with the crowd and gaze with them. So I left Kingston, the popular Jamaican farewell echoing in my mind. Walk good. Be safe on your journey. In other words, and all the best. In your endeavours. I arrived in New York City ready to lose myself in white men's Manhattan crowds with their turbulent music chorus. I marvelled at what Jane Jacob praised at the ballet of the good city sidewalk in her old neighbourhood, the West Village. I walked up past midtown skyscrapers, releasing their energy as lively people onto the streets and on into the upper west side with its regal Bose Arts apartment building, stylish residence and buzzing streets. Onward into Washington Heights, the sidewalk spilled over into an emblem mix of young and old Jewish and Dominican American residents, past leafy inward with parks whose grades rose roses to reveal beautiful views of the Hudson River. Up to my home in Kingsbridge in the Bronx, with its rows of brick bungalows and apartment buildings nearby Broadway's bustling sidewalks and the peaceful expanse of the Van Cortlandt Park. 
I went to Jackson Heights in Queens to, to take in people socialising around the garden courtyards in Urdu, Korean, Spanish, Russian and Hindi. And when I wanted a taste of home, I headed to Brooklyn and Crown Heights for Jamaican food and music humour mixed in with the flavour of New York City. The city was my playground. I explored the city with my friends and then with a woman I'd begun dating. She walked around endlessly with me, taking in New York City's many pleasures. Coffee shops open until pre-dawn, parks with nooks aplenty, food and music from across the globe, quirky neighbourhoods with quirkier residents. My impressions of the city took shape during my walks with her. As, as with the relationship, those first few months of urban exploration were all romance. The city was beguiling, exhilarating, vibrant. But it wasn't long before reality reminded me I wasn't invulnerable, especially when I walked alone. One night in the East Village, I was running to dinner when a white man in front of me turned and punched me in the chest with such force that I thought my ribs had braided around my spine. I assumed he was drunk or had mistaken me for an old enemy, but found out soon enough he'd merely assumed I was a, a criminal because of my race. When he, discovered, when he discovered I wasn't what he imagined, he went on to tell me that his assault was my own fault for running up behind him. I blew off this incident as an aberration, but the mutual distrust between me and the police was impossible to ignore. It felt elemental. They'd enter a subway platform, I noticed them, and I noticed all the other black men registering their presence as well, while just about everyone else remained oblivious to, to them. They'd glare. I'd get nervous and glance. They'd observe me steadily. I'd get uneasy. I'd observe them back, worrying that, that I would look suspicious. Their suspicions would increase. We'd continued the silent, uneasy dialogue until the subway arrived and separated us at last. I returned to the, to the old rules I'd set myself in New Orleans, with elaboration, no running, especially at night, no sudden movements, no hoodies, no objects, especially shiny ones in hand, no waiting for friends on street corners, lest I be mistaken for a drug dealer, no standing near a corner on, the cell, on my cell phone. As comfort set in, I in inevitably began to break some of those rules until a night encounter sent me zealously back to them. Having learned that anything less than vigilant was carelessness. After a sumptuous Italian dinner and drinks with friends, I was jogging to the subway at Columbus Circle. I was running late to meet another set of friends at a concert downtown. I heard someone shouting. I looked up to see a police officer approaching with his gun trained on me. Against the car! In no time, half a dozen cops were upon me, chucking me across the car and tightly handcuffing me. Why were you running? Why, where were you going? Where are you coming from? I said, why are you running? Since I couldn't answer everyone at once, I decided to respond first to the one who, who looked most likely to hit me. I was surrounded by a swarm and tried to focus on just one without inadvertently aggravating the others. It didn't work. As I answered that one, the others got frustrated for I wasn't answering them fast enough and barked at me. One of them digging, digging through my empty pockets asked if I had any weapons, the question, a question more than an accusation. Another badgered me about where I was coming from, as if on the 15th round I decided to tell them the truth he imagined. Though I kept saying calmly, of course, which meant trying to manage a tone that ignored my racing heart and their spittle-filled shouts in my face that I had just left friends two blocks down the road, who were all still there and could vouch for me to meet other friends, whose texts on my phone could verify that yes, yes sir, officer, of course officer, it made no, but it made no difference. For black men to assert their dignity before the police was to risk assault. In fact, the dignity of black people meant less to them, which was why I felt safer being stopped in front of a white witness than black witnesses. The cops had less regard for, the wit for witnesses or entreaties of black onlookers, whereas the concern of white witnesses usually registered to them. 
A black witness asking a question or politely raising an objection could quickly become a fellow detainee. Deference to the police then was, was to make the encounter safer. Oh, sorry, it's getting a bit dark. I'm going to quickly turn the light on. The cops ignored my explanations and my suggestions and continued to snarl at me. My, all except one of them, a captain. He put his hand on my back and said to no one in particular. If he was running for a long time, he would have been sweating. He then instructed that the cuffs be removed. He told me that a black man had stabbed someone earlier two or three blocks away and they were searching for him. I noted that I had no blood on me and had told his fellow officers where I'd been and they how to check my alibi, unaware that it was even an alibi as no one had told me why I was being held. And of course, I hadn't dared ask. From what I'd seen, anything beyond passivity could be interpreted as aggression. The police captain said I could go. None of the cops who detained me for an apology was necessary. Like the thug who punched me in the East Village, they seemed to think it was my own fault for running. Humiliated. I tried to make eye contact with the onlookers on the sidewalk, and I was reluctant to pass them to be as I passed them by my, um, on my way. The captain, maybe noticing my shame, offered to give me a ride to the subway station. When he dropped me off and I thanked him for his help, he said, It's because you were polite that we let you go. If you're acting up, we'd a, it would have ended differently. I nodded and said nothing. I realised that what I least liked about walking in New York City wasn't merely having to learn new rules of navigation and socialisation. Every city has its own. It was the arbitrariness of the circumstances that required them. An arbitrariness that made me feel like a child again, that infantilised me. When we first learn to walk, the world around us threatens to crash into us. Every step is risky. We train ourselves to walk without crashing by being attentive to our movements and extra attentive to the world around us. As adults, we walk without thinking, really. But as a black adult, I, often, I am often returned to that moment in childhood when I'm just learning to walk. I am once again on high alert, vigilant. Some days when I am fed up with being considered a troublemaker upon sight, I joke that the last time a cop was happy to see a black male walking was when the male was a baby taking his first steps. On many walks, I ask white friends to accompany me just to avoid being treated like a threat. Walks in New York City, that is, in New Orleans, a white woman in my company sometimes attracted more hostility. And it is not lost on, it, and it is not lost on me that my, that my women friends are those who best understand my plight. They have developed their own vigilance in an environment where they are constantly treated as targets of sexual attention. Much of my walking is, is with my friend Rebecca, who once described, described it as a pantomime undertaken to avoid the choreography of criminality. Walking while black restricts the experience of walking, renders inaccessible the classic romantic experience of walking alone. It forces me to be in constant relationship with others, unable to join the New Yorkers I read about and hoped to, and hoped to join. Instead of meandering aimlessly on the footsteps of Whiteman, Melville, Kazin and Vivian Gornick, more often I felt that I was tiptoeing in bold winds. The Bolden who wrote way back in 1960s, rare indeed is the Harlan citizen from the most circumspect church member to the most shiftless adolescent who does not have a long tail to tell the police incompetence, justice or brutality. I myself have witnessed and endured it more than once. Walking as a black man has made me feel simultaneously more removed from the city. In my awareness that I am perceived as a suspect and more closely connected to it, in the full attentiveness demanded by my own vigilance, it has made me walk more. It has made me walk more purposely in the city, becoming part of its flow, rather than observing, observing and standing apart.
But it also means that I'm still trying to arrive in a city that isn't quite mine. One definition of home is that it's somewhere that we can almost always be ourselves. And when we are more ourselves, but when are we more ourselves than when we are walking? That natural state in which we repeat one of our first actions we learnt. Walking. The simple monotonous act of placing one foot before the other to prevent falling turns out to not be as simple as you'd think if you're black. Walking alone has been anything from monotonous for me. A foot leaves, a foot lands, and our longing gives it momentum from rest to rest. We long to look, to think, to talk, to get away. But more than anything else, we long to be free. We want the freedom and pleasure of walking without fear, without others' fear, wherever we choose. I've lived in New York City for almost a decade and have not stopped walking its fascinating streets. And I have not stopped longing to find the solace that I found as a kid in the streets of Kingston. Much as coming to know New York City streets has made it closer to, ho closer to home to me, the city also withholds itself from me via those very streets. I walk them, alternatively, alternatively invisible and too prominent. So, I walk caught between memory and forgetting, between memory and forgiveness. So that that's the piece. So um, yeah, that's Garnet Cadogan's essay. So as I said in the beginning, um, for some of you that might not have been at the start, um, that is the piece is called. Walking While Black by Garnet Cadogan. So it's an essay that first appeared in an issue of Freeman's and it's forthcoming in Defire. Um, so the, the actual piece of the essay is Defire This Time, A New Generation Speaks About Race. So I think, yeah, I think everyone should check it out. It's really, it's a really powerful piece and considering everything that's been happening in America, I think it, it's really appropriate. But yeah, so I, well, it looks like I have four, four extra minutes. I, I must have read quite quite quickly um i guess i oh, i've got a comment both wonderful and sad thank you well, well thank you thank you guys for for tuning in i hope you guys all all enjoyed it um but yeah i got i got a few more minutes i don't know what you what you guys thought thought about it but yeah i think it was definitely a really thought evoking piece for me because yeah how we experience the city and like the simple acts of just walking is such a, a powerful a powerful act but um yeah i'm gonna leave you guys all to it then and hopefully i'll see you for a, another bedtime story i hope too many of you didn't actually fall asleep during the bedtime story but thank you for tuning in and i'll see, see you guys all soon and stay safe stay safe